everyone, and welcome to the Squad Room Podcast, the place for cops who want to transform their leadership, create more resilience, and generate more balance in their life. On this show, we cover the tactics and strategies you can use every day to create a life worth living both in and out of uniform. My name is Garrett Tesla, and I'm a full-time lieutenant for a sheriff's office in Southern California, and I'm glad you're with us today. Before we get to our guest, I want to remind you of a few things. First, if you're on social media, make sure you're following us at The Squad Room and that you've liked our Facebook page. Also, make sure to join our Facebook group. Just search The Squad Room group to join. But most importantly is that you head over to thesquadroom.net and get signed up for our mailing list. People on that list get exclusive access to free resource downloads and a weekly email from me on things you need to know about. I also send out content that's exclusive to that list, so don't miss out on something that can help you in your life or in your job. Join our list at thesquadroom.net. This episode is sponsored by officerprivacy.com. In the age of the internet, social media, and smartphones, there's so much amazing information at our fingertips. I can research any topic or person I want to and learn all about them, their family, and way more information than I really should be able to. The problem is people can do that research on us too. Whether we like it or not, our information is on the internet, out there for people to find, even the bad guys. Just accepting this and doing nothing isn't an option. We as cops have a giant target on our back these days. Sometimes that's literal and it's life or death, and other times it's just dealing with potential harassment. Either way, we don't want to expose our families to these risks. Being careful about what you post on social media doesn't go far enough. It's easy for a bad guy with an iPhone and free Wi-Fi to hunt you down. That's why OfficerPrivacy.com exists. My friend Pete James is the founder, and he spent 25 years in law enforcement here in California. Using much of his career to hunt down the criminal's and evidence on the computers and the internet that we now use. Pete knows how easy it is to find you, and since he's one of the good guys, he can help. OfficerPrivacy.com offers two packages to choose from to help you clean up your side of the internet. Their premium service allows you to sit back and let the professionals do the work where they will work to scrub the internet's top 50 people search sites that can expose your home address. Then they work to maintain your privacy by monitoring those same sites. If you show up again, they will remove you again. They also offer an at-home solution for those of you that have the time and the technical ability to do it yourself. I don't, so that's why I use their premium service, but you can do it all yourself using their proprietary software. You can remove yourself and your family members from these same top 50 people search sites on the internet, and then use the software to conduct audits as often as you'd like to make sure that you haven't been added back. To learn more about how you can keep safe, check them out at officerprivacy.com forward slash the squad room. When you sign up through that link, you'll get a free... USB data blocker, and your first month of monitoring is free. That's officerprivacy.com forward slash the squad room. You know, whether you're the chief, a sergeant, a patrol officer, or anyone in between, one of the most time-consuming and frustrating parts of managing people is dealing with the schedule. From shift bids to overtime and special events, vacation requests, court overtime, and unexpected critical incidents and major disasters, the schedule is like a living, breathing beast that must be wrestled with at every level of an agency. If your agency is still living in the dark ages, running off an Excel spreadsheet, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why I'm so impressed with InTime. InTime is designed specifically for public safety agencies, from police and sheriff's offices to corrections, dispatch, and fire agencies. Their cloud-based system and their smartphone app allow officers to access the system from anywhere to sign up for overtime, submit vacation requests, and get updated on court subpoenas. Their system is incredibly easy to use and only takes a few minutes, not hours, to understand and begin using. Major agencies like the Anaheim Police Department, Pittsburgh Police, Passaic County Sheriff's Office, CAL FIRE, and many others trust in time to save them time and money. If you're interested in spending less time on scheduling, eliminating redundant and expensive overtime, increasing your compliance with subpoenas, and reducing the stress and fatigue on your employees, Please, I beg of you, go to intime.com forward slash the squad room to learn more about their system. Richard Gerling of Mindful Badge, welcome back to the show. A three-peat, your third time on the show. Thanks for being here, man. Gary, pleasure to be here, brother. We uh, connected very early on in the squad room. You're in, you're on like episode, like early, early double digits, like 17, 18, maybe somewhere in there, I think. And then you came back again a couple years later. Uh, we uh, have had the fortunate opportunity to break bread together uh, in person, which is not always something I get to do with guests who are scattered around the world. And uh, I consider you uh, a very, a very dear friend, but also uh, a mentor in my path towards 
mindfulness. So I appreciate everything you've done for me and, and I'm sure what you're going to do for me and for our listeners today as we talk. So thanks for coming back on. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Really a privilege to be here. And I got to tell you, you know, as I travel around the U.S. and Canada talking to first responders, man, your podcast gets it gets propped up. You know, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, put it on the squad room, you know, and it's just it's super cool to hear that people, you know, people are listening. And I think that this media is so critically important for us to normalize our experience and, and to know that, yeah. oh, someone else has felt that way or someone else has gone through a similar experience. And, and how I responded to that isn't so far off the mark, you know? And so yeah, yeah. kudos to you, brother. Thank you for the work you're doing here. Thanks. I love hearing uh, that the show is, is being received elsewhere or that it's being heard and that it's kind of coming back around. That uh, gives me a stronger sense of purpose than I could ever really articulate in, in the English language, you know? Um, you just you just triggered a memory I got recently. I haven't I haven't made a T-shirt in a long time, but a buddy of mine texted me. He lives nowhere near me. Uh, texted me that he was uh, at a training with a bunch of different agencies, and someone was wearing one of my T-shirts. And that impact alone was uh, was was really really cool. So so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, for people that don't know, because it's been like we haven't had you on. We've been talking, of course, throughout the last couple of years, but we haven't actually had you on the show since like pre-COVID. Can you give people who aren't familiar with you a, a synopsis of your your work history so that they understand that, you know, you are you are quite literally one of us? <laughs> yeah. So thank you for that. Um, so I uh, I spent 24 years in um, what I like to refer to as civilian law enforcement, retired as a police lieutenant up here in Oregon at an agency outside of Portland. Um, I also have um, several years on active duty with the U.S. Coast Guard and then kind of a parallel career uh, when I was in policing in the Coast Guard Reserve. Um, and my my experience, you know, in police work and in the Coast Guard has primarily been operational. Um, you know, of course, in policing, mildly interesting career, did all the things you do, you know, patrol detectives and all that stuff. Um, and in the Coast Guard, I was primarily uh at sea, um, doing search and rescue missions and that sort of thing. And then it, it eventually, you know, in command posts, uh, command centers, um, managing search and rescue missions. So, um, that's kind of my background. Uh, I'm also, um, I retired in 2019. Uh, I like to say I'm a, a full-time trainer and consultant. Uh, I founded mindful badge a number of years ago as a side hustle when I was still working, um, and, and I'm also really, I think, privileged to have a role at Pacific University in the Graduate School of Psychology at the Mindful Health and Resilience Lab. And we've been doing research on mindfulness training and policing um, for about a decade now. So um, kind of wear a hat as a researcher, trainer, um, consultant. And you're, you're being, uh, I was going to say coy almost, you're being coy almost in the fact that you are very much and you know mindfulness is now very much a buzzword and it's very much kind of thankfully it's become an accepted practice and i think more cops are becoming far more open to it than they were but that door didn't open without people like you early early on and long before i ever set foot on the idea or even tried it myself you were out there teaching these things and advocating for these things uh in your in your department but also in your own trainings and in the writings and in your research so for people listening, I want to, I want to make sure they understand that you are very much uh, one of the uh, f forefathers of mindfulness in policing because I think that's important to understand. Yeah, thank you. And and the other thing I'll say too, and we might this might come up in conversation, but it's just important. Um, I, I'm also a certified mindfulness teacher, uh, certified trained at UCLA, and um, as we talk about the integrity of mindfulness training, that, that'll be an important point. And if we don't get there, that's fine. But at least I mentioned that much. Yeah. No, you, um, your, your, your resume is, is long and, and you actually helped me get into a, a study done at UC San Diego, uh, on resilience training and mindfulness for first responders that I got to participate in about a, about a year ago now. That was really, really interesting. Uh, and what was cool about about that, it was it was a cohort of other cops from around the country. Um, of course, I ended up being randomized into a group with one of my bosses. 
<laughs> but so, so, you know, provided some awkward conversation sometimes, I suppose. Um, but, uh, no, you know, it was, it was these cops from around the country who really for, by and large had no introduction or no concept of mindfulness or self-awareness practices or sorts. It was an eight week program and watching, you know, watching them move through that spectrum was really amazing. And watching at the end, uh, people who were struggling with transitions into retirement, how they were at much more at peace with that. People who were struggling with illnesses. Um, it was really, really great. And I was further along in my own journey than most, but I uh, still got a lot out of it and still got to challenge some of my own concepts. So, so that was really interesting. And hopefully UC San Diego is going to going to be coming out with a more robust law enforcement or first responder program in the future. I wanted to, you know, in thinking about talking to you today, I could go a million different ways because this truly is uh, one of my deepest interests at this point in my life. Um, I, w- I was reading uh, stuff before we came on that almost want, I wanted to go in that direction. But what I really want to talk about today and I want to use you, and I told you this before we started recording, but um, I want to, I want you to be my sounding board in some sense as I flush out some ideas over some recent events in my life. And, and then also I want to share some, what I think are some very significant lessons out of that. And this will probably, the lessons learned from this will probably leak out over time. I'm still learning them. I'm still recognizing them just this morning in my own journal. I had one of those aha moments. And so this isn't a comprehensive review, but it's sort of a first pass, I guess, is what I want to do. And I want to do it because I know that, you know, I, I went through something earlier this year. I'll explain it in a second, but there's cops, just like all humans, are going through a lot of stuff right now. You know, there's a lot of people listening who, are just struggling with a really difficult political environment in their city, uh, you know, or lack of support from administration or a lack of communication. Those are all real common things we hear, right? But then there's personal health issues or there might be financial issues or there might be marital issues. And I think the concept that you and I both certainly would both agree on is that suffering exists. And it may not be suffering in a physical sense or in a long-term terminal sense, but just the challenges of everyday life can sometimes get overwhelming. And I want to talk today about some of the strategies we can use to maybe overcome those things or to maybe keep them in perspective as we have to navigate them. And so uh, what I'll share is that, and I shared this on Instagram and with my newsletter already, so this may be a repeat for some people. If you're not on either of those, shame on you. Follow me at the squad room and join our mailing list at the squadroom.net. But uh, for several years, I've been, I was diagnosed with GERD, you know, or acid reflux. And I was on medication for it, which to me was odd because I had none of the symptoms of it. You know, I'd have heartburn when I ate some spicy tacos and drank a couple extra margaritas, but by and large, I had no symptoms of acid reflux. And about a year ago now, almost exactly a year ago, those symptoms started to actually appear and then get worse. And then they became things that weren't acid reflux. And I had to really self-advocate for pushing for more tests and demanding some more attention and getting to see specialists. And that's a lesson in itself is to be your own advocate. Mm -hmm. But um, I was diagnosed with a disease, an esophageal disease called achalasia, which is super, Mm -hmm. super rare. Uh, and, and, uh, and very, um, very unknown, right? It's, so it's, it's very rare. And I joked several times that at least my mother was right that I'm very special. And <laughs> um, the short version is your esophagus, in, with achalasia, your esophagus muscles stop working. So they can't push the food down to your stomach. And then the junction at your stomach, which is called the lower esophageal sphincter, Still funny. You can laugh at that. The word sphincter is always going to be funny to me. (laughs) Um, But it closes up. The nerves in that sphincter die and it closes up. And then eventually food can't pass from your esophagus to your stomach. And so obviously the natural end result is that food stays in your esophagus or it doesn't stay anywhere and it comes back up. Um, It is the most painful thing 
I've ever been through. Uh, the most horrific side effects and symptoms and just challenges and difficulties dealing with it. And the medical system being what it is, of course, everything takes time, the tests, uh, getting the results for the test to then go get the next test. There's three tests you have to take to get diagnosed with this. It's, it's quite an ordeal. And keep in mind also, I am fully aware that there are other things that people may have that are quote unquote, more difficult than this, right? We all have, we all have it, uh, something. Um, so I'm keeping that in perspective as well. But for me, this is most certainly, most certainly the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. The most challenging thing in my life. It was challenging for my family. My diet, of course, had to uh, significantly change. Um, actually, it didn't even really matter what I ate. It was just nothing worked. And that culminated in, as we record this today, uh, a surgery that I had on my birthday of all times down in LA. And it's such a rare disease that, which has no known cause, which is part of the element of, I want to talk about today of not having attribution to a suffering, right? I can't pinpoint something to it. I can't blame something or I can't blame myself even, right? Yeah, that's a, I think yeah. that's something I want to get to, but right. uh, unknown cause, I, I end up having the surgery on my 45th birthday. And, uh, here we are about a week out from that surgery and symptoms have, have dissipated significantly. I'll, I'll say that, you know, I'm still struggling with post-op kind of recovery and healing and all that. Um, the, Basically what they do, there's only two ways to, sol to to kind of mitigate the symptoms. You can't cure it, but you can mitigate the symptoms. There's two ways to do it. I chose one which is called a poem, like reading a poem, where they go in through your esophagus, slice the between the two linings of your esophagus, and then actually cut that sphincter muscle open to relax it. And um, that's the least invasive version of it. Uh, and so... Yeah, so that's the that's the kind of the synopsis of what I've been dealing with. Um, but I've learned so much, mm -hmm. and it's only because of conversations like we've had in the past and doing my own work on my own practice in advance that I feel like I'm coming out of this whole, or if not more whole than when I went in. If that makes sense. And this easily could have shattered me, uh, just like any serious health diagnosis. But instead, I, I, I am, I'll just say it, I'm proud of myself for being able to integrate a lot of these things into my life. You know, these are things, some of these things I just have to, but I've also been pretty aware of the lessons. And I've, and I've said throughout, look for the lesson and I found a ton. So that's where I want to start with today. And I apologize for taking up a huge chunk to give that explanation, but I think context in this is really important because it's going to color everything I do basically henceforth. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. and so we'll start, we'll start it there, I guess. And so, so, so back to kind of the broad community, the, 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 something we hear often in mindfulness, but around is to stay present and to stay in the present, uh, present time, present, you know, present sense. I I'd like to begin with your definition of what that means and being present versus being elsewhere. Yeah. Garrett, first, let me just say, um, I, I thank you for, you know, we've had conversations about vulnerability and strength and, you know, authentic courage. Right. And mm -hmm. to bring this to your podcast, in service to your listeners is pretty remarkable, right? There's a sense of, hey, I'm gonna tell you about this really intense medical issue and this experience. Um, and what's amazing is that we can do this and it's uh, it, it's a, it's it's really in service to the conversation and, and, and how the conversation can support other people. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'll say something about suffering and then I'll define mindfulness for you, presence. Um, there's a few things that came to mind as I was listening to you about suffering. One is suffering's real. Um, suffering sucks and suffering's unavoidable. And I think the unavoidable nature of some of our suffering um, really challenges our need um, 
to feel like we are in control. And one of the things that I talk to first responders a fair amount about is that, that this idea that control is a delusion, that we never really have control. We, we can regulate things, right? And, and there's, there's a lot of variables around that. But I think what happens is we feel when we suffer, whether it's a medical issue or occupational trauma injury or other things, that we feel this sense of loss of control. And, and I want to separate the loss of control from the loss of agency, because I think that you are demonstrating a sense of agency. And by agency, what I mean is your ability to be in suffering and skillfully move through it. And still it sucks, right? So you're, you're embracing the suck, right? As, as our, as our uh, DOD friends would say. Um, but you're also, you have agency. So you have the ability to work with your suffering. Okay. And so now I'll switch and I'll define mindfulness. First of all, I want to say that this notion of being in the present is kind of bullshit because no one really knows what the fuck it means. Right. It's like, what are we even saying? And it, and it's overwhelmingly annoying. Um, so here's how I would define mindfulness. Mindfulness is simply training our attention so that we can pay attention on purpose to both internal information and external information while we are skillfully regulating the experience of self. So, you know, maybe in your case, <clears throat> your mindfulness practice integrated into your life when you're at the doc is taking in information from your doctor about your diagnosis and also noticing how your body feels, noticing the anxiety emerging, the fear emerge, the, all these things that show up naturally as a part of any human getting information about their health, right? And so, and, and being in it and regulating it, not controlling it, but regulating it. Right. And we do this thing called mindfulness because we want to maximize positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right. We want to maximize. Okay. I'm in this game. Okay. This is what the doc's telling me. This is the third, you know, the third specialist I've seen. Okay. So I've got some corroboration. It's not just one person telling me something. Um, okay. I, you know, I'm in this now. Right. And so it's, it's not a, um, and you don't get to control that because if we could control things like medical issues, we would just make them go away. Wouldn't we like, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, so, course. um, so being in the present is it's maybe we could have fun talking about that, but it's annoying because here's what, here's what I observe is we have these colloquial, you know, nice little Insta posts that say, you know, be in the now. And we have people who are suffering who don't know how to do that. They don't know how to be in their suffering. And the power, I think, of a mindfulness skills practice is that we learn how to suffer, which sounds so counterintuitive. Well, why do I want to do that? Well, because suffering is unavoidable and, and it's going to come in all kinds of variations and all kinds of, of uh, intensities. And, um, and the more skillful we get at suffering, the more skillful we get at experiencing joy, the more skillful we get at gratitude of, wow, you know, I have this disease and I had to have the surgery and, and I'm at home and I get to see the smile on my kid's face. Right. Um, and so many other things. That's a, that's a perfect segue, I guess, to, I, I wasn't expecting that answer, but at the same time, a perfect segue to kind of the broader question. And, you know, for, for me, I guess when I think of presence, I think of not being hooked by the potentials, the potential outcomes we can't control anyway. Yeah. You know, and stand, and so staying with those things that are immediately in front of us, those feelings and those sensations, those, the, those things that, that are right in there with us, right in our chest or right at, at arm's length from us. Um, you know, I, I have a quote on my office wall from the Dalai Lama that I'm going to bastardize, but essentially there's only two days in your life where you can't, uh, where you can't do anything to affect positive change. And that's yesterday and tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, today, today is an opportunity. And so I think of, I think of presence sometimes in that sense, but, but the suffering is that's, that's where I kind of want to take this because there's a lot of, like you said, misconceptions around it, but also of obviously fear around it. And I think we think of suffering as like a big S suffering, you know, and that there's oftentimes suffering sometimes is just dealing with an inbox that just won't, you know, clean itself out yeah. or a challenging partner. Like though there are, I think cops, especially we, we have an immediate aversion 
and we want to stiff arm away any sense of this idea that we we are struggling like we got it we can do this it's us you know like but but that doesn't do us any good i learned that real quick and we have to integrate how to suffer well right so and I think how do we do are, that <laughs> yeah well I think there's some ways. And I think one of the things is we have conversations like this where, you know, this conversation is pushing back against the cultural narrative and policing that suggests suffering is about just being badass, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just about, it's just about toughing, toughening through it, sucking it up, right? Well, um, partially. Um, but part of the problem is that when we suffer, we hide it. I mean, this is what the data tell us, right? I mean, the data tell us that when cops suffer, we hide it, right? We often won't, you know, we often won't go seek those interventions, like going to see our medical doc, right? We don't seek integrated medicine. We don't, we often won't, well, we often won't go see a mental health clinician. And if, if we do, perhaps we're hiding it there in the privacy of that privilege, right? Um, and, and, and we certainly, you know, we don't need to walk around the police precincts, you know, telling everybody about our suffering that's that's dysregulated right that's just that's what we call dysregulated mm -hmm. however to confront one's own suffering is a critical it's critical it's the only path forward right and um when we when we talk about the definition of mindfulness as we say paying attention on purpose we, we say to internal and external information frequently that internal information is um it's challenging emotion. It's challenging health conditions. It's, it's a challenging self-narrative, right? Because one of the things, Garrett, that you experienced, I have no doubt, to some degree, is when you're sitting there getting briefed by the specialist, the medical specialist, in your mind, you're, you're already starting a narrative about how awful this is right? No. You're already doing the combinations and per permutations of your future self. And, and that does not serve you well right? Because they're mm -hmm. typically going to be very negative. Mm -hmm. And, and then those create a neurophysiological, um, stress response. And now, now you're even more intense in, in challenging emotion and challenging thinking. And it's a cycle that can just sort of rinse and repeat. Right. <clears throat> so we, we really do need to confront our, our internal data. Right. And so confronting our suffering is critically important. Um, Carl Jung is, uh, you know, uh, one of the founding fathers of modern psychology um, and did a lot of amazing things. And, and um, there's a quote that's attributed to him that says something like, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our lives and we will call it fate. And I think that so frequently we suffer and we avoid it. We suffer and we want to cover it up. We are master maladapters in, in, in public safety. Mm -hmm. And and maladaption is just a way of not confronting our suffering. And so we avoid. And as long as we're avoiding the roots of, and there are probably multiple roots of our suffering, it's going to continue to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And until we illuminate it, and sometimes that involves illuminating kind of the dark shadows of our own life, the dark shadows of our own thinking the dark shadows of our own emotion, right? And sometimes it's the dark shadows of our genetic uh, predispositions for disease, <laughs> you know? And until we just face it, and we don't have to do it all at once or do it with such intensity that it's overwhelming, but until we begin to face our, our own experience, we're kind of locked in suffering. And this is what we often see. I think this is why we um, have... We have such a ridiculous suicide rate. Just this morning, good friend of mine works for a federal agency, said, hey, man, we just lost another agent to suicide, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I guess we're all tired of that. And, and, and what we know is we get to a place of suicide, we've gotten to this hopelessness, this helplessness, this total despair of where you have no agency, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that, you know, we see happen that we, we want to, we want to illuminate and, and reduce and eliminate if we can as a, as a system. I think too, we often, and I, I want to back, back up real quick. And I want to be very clear with people. Like I also engage in maladaptive uh, coping mechanisms during this time. Right. I, I recognize, I mean, I, at least I recognized it, but I also knew <laughs> like, this is not the best way to deal with this. Uh, you know, um, 
so I, I like I'm not sitting there in my in my flowing robes, you know, meditating, levitating three feet off the ground, just nailing it and getting through this whole thing. I definitely had my my challenges, but uh, what I found was, you know, the gap. There's a gap between the way things are and the way things way we want things to be, and in that gap is anxiety, and that is where the most suffering happens. You know, like in my present moment, there is some suffering, but it's in the gap between when I start to really ruminate on the difference between how things are versus the way I want them to be, which really means I don't have control over. That is where the most suffering happens. What, what's your experience with that? Yeah. I mean, I think I love how you frame that, like this gap between how things are and how I want them to be. Um, you know, you, you frame that as anxiety. And I think, you know, if there's weather in that space, it certainly is full of, of winds of anxiety. And I think that that produces a lot of inner narrative that drives maybe further maladaptive behavior. Um, I am super interested, Garrett, in how we talk to ourselves. I'm really interested into, you know, this, this, inner critic narrative that is amplified by occupational stress and trauma and often toxic cultures and, and, and toxic political situations right now, all kinds of things that are really, I think, impacting the inner narrative. And, and that inner narrative um, doesn't, well, often it, it doesn't get coaching, right? You know, we don't go to training on, you know, how to, how to have a really positive inner coach, right? You know, um, and, and I think we should, um, and mindfulness can help us do that. But I think that, you know, that space that you've defined is the space. Um, it's sort of the, it could be the desert. It could be the doldrums. It could be, you know, so many, so many opportunities for us to, um, to not move forward, you know? And, and I mm -hmm. think too, the other, the other point that you made that I really want to just, um, I want to highlight is that this is an imperfect journey, right? So, um, what do, what I mean by that? Like, we're all going to be imperfect. We're going to do things that are maladaptive. We're going to make mistakes. Um, and I think learning how to fail, whether it's micro failures or big failures is a really critical part of, of being an awesome human being. Um, it's just the nature, you know, just like suffering will happen. Failure will happen. And, um, to be in that space where we can learn how to fail is really important because I think in that, in that, space of anxiety that you've defined between how things are and how we want them to be. Um, there's hope for, for forward momentum, but, but I'm not sure we can get there without failure. I'm not sure we can get there without making mistakes, um, mm -hmm. for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. And, and it's really comes back to that self-talk because when we, if we, when, when we fail, not if, cause when, right. When we fail, we have an opportunity if we choose to widen that gap, or to look at it as a lesson for, for, okay, now we know that's not the way to do it. And we're actually closer to achieving it, being as close, being the way thing we want things to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, our ability to move through that gap is, I, I think we all have it as human beings. And, and I think that often, comes back to self-talk. I well, think. right. What gets in our way is our narrative. Like, oh right. man, I, I, you know, I, I, I drank too much or, you know, I did whatever and that I'm a terrible person. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes our vices, our habits get in our way in that space. Sometimes behavior, you know, interpersonal behavior gets in the way of that space. All kinds of things show up in that space that can get in our way. And I think that, um, we are so programmed, we're so socialized to, be self judgmental and uh, and of course judgmental to each other which is a whole nother conversation um okay. we 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 just self-defeat and you know and i'm not suggesting that oh you know i went out and got drunk six nights in a row and gotten bar fights every night and escaped getting arrested woohoo you know that's awesome no i'm suggesting that we if that was the case if that was the behavior to go wow okay you know what can i learn here you know, what can I learn about, what can I explore about why I did those things and what was the outcome? How did those serve me? You know, did this serve me well? 
is the question I like to ask. You know, there's a whole, there's all kinds of conversation in, in the marketplace now about habits and good habits and bad habits. And, and there's some, I think there's some good content, but I also think there's a tremendous amount of nonsense that is counterproductive. Um, I think I don't believe in good or bad habits. I believe in habits that serve us well and habits that don't serve us well. And, and, and that is a coaching narrative, right? So in other words, if, if I, let's say I'm trying to quit smoking, let's say, let's say maybe I'm in that space between, you know, where things are and where I want to be. And smoking is a way for me to maladapt. Smoking is a way for me just to escape, right? Whatever, get the nicotine, whatever. And, and if I smoke a cigarette, let's say I haven't smoked a cigarette for three years. Now I'm smoking cigarettes again. And I'm like, oh man, this is a bad habit. I'm a bad person because I'm doing this bad habit. Right. And so I identify with the almost moral judgment of bad. And, mm. and, and often that just leads me to just anchoring into it. Well, you know, fuck it. Right. This is who I am. And mm -hmm. rather than, oh yeah, this is interesting that I went to nicotine because this is, I'm so stressed. I'm so dysregulated <clears throat> that I went to the nicotine. I went to this, this old habit of, of maladaption and okay. All right. That makes sense. Makes sense. It does not serve me well. Therefore I will work not to do this. Right. So maybe it's a, maybe I'm going to seek an intervention. Maybe I'm going to go to my, you know, psychotherapist and, and, and get some accountability. Maybe I'm going to go to my medical doc and get some nicotine gum or whatever. Right. Um, or, or maybe none of those things, but I'm going to take some kind of action to work with that maladaptive habit, knowing that I am not a bad human being. Right. And knowing that, okay, that was a failure, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think the way we talk to ourselves in that space of anxiety is horrible, right? And, and, and I'm just going to throw this out too. And again, maybe another conversation, but it's, it's supported and, and sustained by a overt culture of how we all interact with each other that is very similar. And one of the things I believe after years of studying how we respond to suffering and how we treat each other inside of our organizations is I think that we need to have some certainty, Garrett. You, you mentioned this earlier. You, you mentioned like, you know, why did I get this disease, right? What, what, was the po what was the point of causation? And for most of our suffering, there is no point of, of logical causation. Mm -hmm. There are multiple things that come together. And even then, there's no, there's no absolute certainty of how we got here. And we spend a lot of time worrying about how we got here rather than actually being where we are. Right. No, so and we strive to make sense of the suffering we see in the world. And what makes, what, what we do then is we become very judgmental, right? Oh, you know, homeless dude on the street. Well, man, if you just, you know, shower, shave and get a job, What's the problem, right? Um, and I'm being oversimplif oversimplified here, right? But but we want certainty. This happened because of this, right? And I think what we really ought to confront is that, you know, what all of the all of the wisdom of the lived experience plus lots of scientific literature tell us that we don't really know. <laughs> We don't really know. There's an uncertainty to suffering that is so hard for us to to embrace. And I believe once we embrace that uncertainty, it frees us up to move forward. I, I agree 100 percent. And it and it makes perfect sense. I mean, as humans, we want attribution for causes. You know, I mean, you, you go back. Uh, I'm not an anthropologist, but you could basically explain any world religion, any dogma in any way as us trying to make sense of the world all the way down to us as cops. What's our job? We go look for evidence, you know, we go look for evidence. We look for a reasonable suspicion, probable cause, and then we have to go prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Like that's in our DNA right. is to look for attribution. And so for me, um, it, it was almost, it was very frustrating that I couldn't pin it to something, but at the same time, it was probably much healthier for me that I, you know, I, I could say that it wasn't a two pack a day habit and I have lung cancer. Um, but it, but there's an ambiguity also in that because then I don't have an understanding of, of where I went, but I could have easily gone down the rabbit hole of, if I did have attribution, if I did have a specific reason, a, a cause of then the self-flagellation that comes for the behavior that came, that got me to where I am. And frankly, none of that would matter anyway, because it's done. It's over with. I'm, I'm already here. I have to deal with here. I can't right. deal with back then. Right. 
You know, after the riots and unrest of the summer of 2020, I began to get increasingly concerned about the fact there's so much of my life that is out there accessible to the public. And yes, I know that I'm a public figure in some sort of way, but even then, it still makes me uncomfortable. And I've been trying to figure out where the line should be drawn between what is shared on this podcast or on social media or in interviews I give and what should remain private for the security and safety of my family. Even though I'm a public person, that doesn't mean I want my personal information out there for the bad guys to find. I've arrested enough of them in my career that it makes me nervous to think that my family could be exposed to those dangers. Not long ago, a suspect showed up at the front door of my partner's house, 45 miles away from the station. I've had enough of worrying about it and felt completely outmatched by the internet. I mean, it's the internet. Trying to take my name off of Google seems insurmountable, and I learned that honestly, it is. But there's a lot that we can do to protect ourselves, and that's removing our names from people's search sites and breaking the links between our home address and our names. I learned all this from my friends at OfficerPrivacy.com, who are helping me to clean up my side of the internet. A quick Google search shows just a shocking amount of information about where I live, where I used to live, my family members, their names, their addresses, and even phone numbers. We need help protecting ourselves from the bad guys. You have partners on your beat, so get a partner on the internet. To learn more about how they can keep you safe, check them out at officerprivacy.com forward slash the squad room. When you sign up through that link, you'll get a free USB data blocker and your first month of monitoring is free. That's officerprivacy.com forward slash the squad room. Yeah, I think, you know, as as cops, when we and, and, and you just basically described exactly what I was, if you replaced uh, your analogy to quitting cigarettes with like drinking beer, that was probably my most maladaptive, you know, I would, would, and it wasn't like killing a suitcase of, of natty light, but it was just like, Hey, this, this isn't serving me. And it's enough to be just, it's enough for that. I'm dissociating from this, or even at times my own family, because I, I was overwhelmed, you know, and I, and the compassionate side of me for my own self says that's okay to be overwhelmed. Like it's absolutely normal and you're dealing with a lot. And the other side of me, the one that I had to really watch, you know, the it's like watching a suspect's hands is watching this attitude, protecting my thought of, uh, of self blame, you know, or blaming myself for being maladaptive at times. There were times I was handling a great, I was journaling. I felt like I was present in it. I was sitting with it, but there were times that I maladapted too, but I had, I had to learn that I had to learn not to judge myself for that, but to come back to it and ask, is this serving me? And so I love that idea of not good habits or bad habits, but is this serving me or not? And I think so many things we think of as just kind of the mundane habits that we do, we find they're actually probably not serving us. Uh, It doesn't have to be misuse of drugs or alcohol or, uh, you know, anger and that, that sort of stuff. It could just be routine stuff too. But that was, that was a challenge for me to, to kind of sit with being okay with not being perfect in my response, you know? So I mean, have any more on that specifically, but, uh, that was, that was definitely part of the process. And, uh, and also, really having to understand that people's reactions to it uh, weren't going to be perfect either, you know, because then again, we set up another gap between how we want people to respond versus how they actually respond. And whether that's your coworkers or your spouse or your kids or your parents, you know, when you're dealing with something like that, you may have an expectation of what you need or what you want, uh, but just like going to the doctor, it takes a lot of self-advocacy and an, ex- an explanation because oftentimes when, you're, when, when it's something that you can't hide, um, at least not well, um, people aren't going to know how to help, but they want to help. And that was a huge lesson that I wrote about last week was there's helpers all around us, you know, and humans are inherently good, pe- good beings. I believe that we're social creatures. We want to be part of the tribe. We want to have meaning and purpose in our lives, and we do that by service to others. And uh, I just saw, as I got deeper and deeper into this, people, strangers, all the way to friends and family come out of the woodwork to find ways to help. Um, we talk about a lot. We talk a lot about going inside ourselves to manage our suffering, but how do you relate that to looking outward for for care or assistance? 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's really important, Garrett, <clears throat> is that as we journey through life and, and more specifically, we journey through these careers in public safety, um, what we know is that we will experience trauma injury. We will experience suffering, right? And, 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 and I know that there's a number of points in your career where we could talk about trauma injuries that happen for both of us, right? But that's mm -hmm. not what we're doing right now. But we also have regular life, right? We have life's issues, right? So your your disease, your diagnosis, this journey you're on, um, yeah, it is impacted by your profession. But if you were a school teacher, you'd be doing, you'd be going through the same thing, right? You know. Um, so I, I think that what's important about that is that we have to we have to have interventions in this journey of life of people who are specialists, people who have uh, more information than we do, people who know how to deal with things. And so we call that integrated medicine, right? We, we call that psychotherapy. Uh, we, we also have um, wise friends, you know, we have peer support organizations, whether it's, it's coaching external to our agencies or, or you know, the, the coaching that's available inside of our agencies with, with peer teams and that sort of thing. So I think that um, the external part of this is, in fact, taking action to pursue multiple interventions to get to healing, to get to recovery, to get to post-traumatic growth, right? And, and it's really, really important, I think, for us to to, to really take action. And, you know, coming back to this idea of mindfulness being in the present, being in the present isn't about, oh, I'm noticing that I have this disease and I notice how it impacts me. So it's all fine because I'm levitating and it's great. No, it's about noticing this is how I can, this is how my body feels. This is mm -hmm. how the emotion associated with that observation, that intelligence shows up. This is my narrative and how that shows up. And so, okay, now I need to take some action to work with that. Right. So it's interesting, like, I train mindfulness is all about action and it's all about uncomfortable action most of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and, and there's social interventions too. So there's, there's things of intentionally staying connected to our friends and our family when we're going through hard times. One of the first things we do that we observe and I observe it myself is that we will retreat. We'll retreat away from the people that matter to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we can maybe recognize that and go, oh, okay, it's a little too much, you know, a little, little too much uh, alcohol consumption, a little too much nicotine, a little too much, you know, running away. I'm going to come back. I'm going to engage with my social relationships because these people, these people matter to me and I need them and they need me. And, you know, um, stepping into that discomfort because it's uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable when you're suffering to move into relationships, even the ones that already you already have. It's uncomfortable to talk about stuff because you're like awkward. You don't know what to say. And especially as you define, you know, people around you that want to help you. It's really hard sometimes to know how to have conversations with people who really don't understand what you're experiencing, but, but maybe want to, or, you know, and we say the stupidest things to people who are suffering, you know, and I think so. So part of this is about having grace for that. Like, okay, yeah, all right. I know you, right. I know you mean, well, that was a dumb thing to say but I'm not going to be all reactive about it. Right. Um, so that intervention on multiple fronts in our lives that moving outward is as important as, as being inward too. Mm -hmm. got to have the whole person. You can't just go one direction because that's, that's not really moving to healing the whole person. One thing I found that was common for me was when I was dealing with people outside of myself, which is obviously everybody else, but um, I would, uh, so as part of this, just because of the nature of the disease was losing weight, like significantly. And I was, and, and because of past traumas, like you said, and other stuff, like I had gained, I was overweight, you know, I was, it was, it was, I was not at a healthy weight already. And so it wasn't like I was losing weight and then becoming emaciated and looking, <laughs> looking sick. I was actually looking healthier, which was a weird dynamic, right? Because people were commenting, oh, you're yes. losing weight. What are you doing? You're working out. You got a new diet, uh, <laughs> asking questions. My face is getting thinner. You're and... like, no, I have an incurable disease, right? right. <laughs> and that's, and then, and, and it was a decision of mine not to share that because I didn't want to thrust yeah. that upon someone who was trying to give me a compliment. 
right. know, they're trying to recognize what they what they see as hard work uh, and what they see as progress. Right. And, um, you know, I've seen online people who sometimes get very offended by this idea that people are telling them, oh, you look like you're losing weight, you're healthy and they're suffering with this disease, but they don't share it. I chose to see that as a positive, you know, and that, well, I need to lose the weight. I need to lose the weight. I've been trying. Right. And I was already on that path, thankfully, uh, at some point, but this certainly like put me light years ahead of where I would have been otherwise. Uh, and that, I guess my point in that is that even in the suffering, there are things we can learn or benefits or teachings that come from it. So here I am dealing with this situation where I'm basically have a really hard time eating. Uh, but I'm getting back to a healthier weight, which is dropping my blood numbers down, which is reducing my risk of other diseases. And I can't sit here today and pretend that this disease doesn't have its own benefits to me, you know, not just physically with some of the other things, but just in the mindfulness and the, and the, the lessons I've learned in how to tackle these things, you know, from a, from a mental standpoint. Um, so that, that was, that was a big uh, a big, big lesson for me. And you're right. People aren't going to always know how to approach you. So we have to kind of come inward and look at what you need, you know, and, and it's okay. And it comes back. Like I had to go tell doctors, no, I need this test. Um, and I had to advocate, but I had to tell other people, Hey, I need this tonight, or I'm struggling with this, or this is just, I'm, I'm hurt. Like physically I'm hurting. I can't, you know, stand up straight or more likely I can't lay down. Um, I need your help with this and being very clear and not assuming that people know how to help, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, there's another point I had in that and I've totally lost it, but I'll, I'll try to come back to it hopefully as we, as we talk, but, um, yeah, tons of those lessons about how to, how to interact with other people and navigate those things. Oh, this is the point I wanted to bring up in interacting with other people. I found what was really, really helpful uh, in interactions, but also in what I wanted to accomplish in a day was to set intentions very clearly and then also emphasize or pay attention to where my attention was. So attention with an A and intention with an I, those two things became really, really important to me uh, and in how I navigated each day and then in my interactions with other people. And if you're able to, and I know you can, but I mean, I'd like you to talk on how we can set intentions in our interactions with people when we're maybe navigating through something. Yeah, no, I'm just taking all that in, Garrett. It's it, it's so authentic. Um, yeah, say, again, thanks for sharing all of this. This is really, I think, uh, relevant for folks who have different kinds of suffering, but yet still suffering. Um, so intention, you know, I think that um, kind of coming back to the Carl Jung quote, until we make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct our lives and we'll call it fate. And if you think about how we often move through the rhythms of our day, we just, we wake up in the morning, we have a routine and we go through the routine. Um, if we were to maybe several times throughout the day, or maybe just once in the morning, I kind of like the multiple times during the day. If we were to set an intention for how we want to show up when we encounter people, like maybe I'm at home, maybe I I'm going to work. Um, you know, I'm going to go to go to the locker room, you know, suit up, go to roll call. I might ask myself, how do I want to show up in roll call? Right. And it's kind of a broad question, almost kind of a silly question. But, you know, how, what do you mean how I want to show up? Well, yeah. How do you want to show up? In other words, what attitudes do you want to have when you show up? What energy do you want to bring to that encounter with your with your I almost call them shipmates? Right. With, with your team. Right. Mm -hmm. What what energy? Because we all bring energy, man. And especially mm -hmm. cops. We are strong, smart, capable people. And we carry an energy of of what with us, right? <laughs> Sometimes we carry an energy of just really authentic warrior, compassion, badassery. Sometimes we carry an energy of suffering that we're not aware of. And we bring kind of a, a little bit of a shadow side with us to roll call, right? So if we just, just set an intention of, I want to show up with a positive attitude. 
that's just a really simple intention, right? Or I want to show up, um, you know, I, I want to be really intentional about listening to what other people have to say today, right? I want to see my colleagues in a way maybe I haven't seen them before. Um, but setting an intention sets a waypoint for our inner narrative, right? Without that waypoint, the inner narrative is just what it is. Now, it, it may kind of accidentally fall in line with something that works out really well for us. Um, or it may, it may become wrapped around just chaos in our head. Cause let's face it, right. You know, we have, we have a lot of chaos going on in our head, right. Um, there's, there's research out there that suggests, you know, we have a hundred thousand plus independent thoughts every day. We have, you know, we think at, you know, like 4,000 words per minute, which is a lot, by the way. Um, you know, so we're constantly spinning, constantly having a narrative. And that narrative is influenced by so many things, right? Socialization, education, work culture, uh, level of hydration, nutrition, our physical health, all these things, right? And, and if we just set an intention, we might just be disrupting some of that dysregulated chaos of, of that narrative. And we just give it a waypoint. You know, um, I used to go to a lot of meetings as a police lieutenant and I would. So many meetings. Oh my gosh. Oh, no, I made insane. lieutenant earlier this year. So many meetings. Too many. Too many. I think every, <laughs> every police administrator just should go to their calendar and just, just randomly cut their meetings in half. And then they're probably at a place where there's too many meetings. But, um, but how many times do we go into a space where we meet with colleagues or, you know, other officials in our government and, and we just show up, we just show up, right? And we show up with whatever it is that we have. And I think that maybe setting an intention, okay, I'm going to go to this, this meeting. Here's the context of this meeting. I'm going to show up and I'm just going to remain quiet and listen, or I'm going to, I'm not going to try to be right, or I'm going to regulate my ego because there's two people in this meeting. I kind of want to throat punch or whatever, right? That's the reality of the world we live in, right? And so Maybe I'm going to work on my compassion as I move in here or whatever it is, but we have some intention of how we want to show up in, the, in that context, right? And it's a powerful practice. It's both a cognitive practice and a mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. And it's a game changer as we move through the rhythms of our day because we're disrupting what otherwise is just sort of an unconscious, habitual way of moving through our day. Mm -hmm. That's so great. And I think you know, to bring it to a different uh, area too, is our intention with family. Yes. You know, when you end your shift at the end of the day, what's your intention walking in the door, your interaction with your kids, uh, your, your wife or your husband and setting a very, a very clear intention of, of who you want to be when you show up. Yeah. Um, I, I have, a, I had a conversation with a future guest. We talked a little bit about this, but he, he was a triathlete and he equate, he kind of, uh, uses the analogy of the transitions in between the swim, the, the swim and the bike and the run. Right. And how, when you come into that transition, if we pick up the wrong tools for the next part of the race, we're not going to be successful. I can't do the run in my bike shoes and I right. can't do, uh, the, the run or the, the bike while I'm in my running shoes or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, we have to be intentional about the tools we pick for the next interaction we're about to have. And I thought, I thought that's a really great uh, perspective on it, or an easy to understand analogy. The other thing I want to want to give people some insight on that I really had to had to wrap my head around is that um, your your suffering does not then all of a sudden become the world, you know, mm -hmm. because like you said earlier, every, everyone's suffering with something. And on some days it's mundane and it's minor and it may just be a low hum of suffering an angst about traffic, whatever it is. And some days it's going to be big, but an expectation that then your suffering then takes up the whole room is not going to be successful. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Garrett, there's this, this beautiful quote sometimes attributed to Epictetus um, but that's in dispute, of course, I'm sure with historians. However, the quote is um, something to the effect of be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. Yes. And, you know, it doesn't say be nice. <laughs> right. Right. There's a difference. So the nice is a saccharine kind of bullshitty thing. Kind is just, yeah, man. Yeah, I see. Mm. I see you. I see your suffering. And, I, you know, I wish for you 
you know, more healthy things or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Kindness is, is very workable. We don't have to lose ourselves with kindness, um, but being nice is often problematic. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's, you said something earlier that I, I, I want to, I want to touch on um, with respect to everyone is suffering. Um, that's a really can feel really overwhelming when you're in a profession where your job is to bear witness to human suffering mm, and, and then, true. and then, and then to, you know, attempt to do something about it. Right. And so I think, you know, on one hand, maybe first responders ought to be suffering masters. And on the other hand, I think we have the potential to be, but on the other hand, what we see is just a lot of dysregulated suffering amongst the ranks. Um, and because we, we see so much of it on the job. And then when we experience our own, um, there's just such a deep state of overwhelm. And, and I think that we should acknowledge that state of overwhelm, that feeling of like, oh my God, I just can't do this. Or this is, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do this might be a better way to frame that. But, you know, and I think maybe if nothing else, we, we can really punctuate the hope for people listening. The hope that no matter what your suffering is, one, it's normal. And two, it's workable. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the hope of that normalcy and, and workableness, which I think is not a real word, really comes from, from looking at your suffering, from being in it. It comes from this idea of mindfulness, of sitting in your suffering. And I think, you know, I'll come back to a couple of things I said earlier that, that I think might be helpful to reinforce. One is that suffering is real. It sucks and it's unavoidable. And I think that confronting it is our pathway through it and not necessarily confronting it all at once because that's probably not useful, right? But confronting it with with both strategies of stillness and strategies of action. So sometimes suffering, confronting suffering is about, you know, sitting in a, sitting in a chair for two minutes, breathing and just feeling into the body and noticing how the body feels with this diagnosis, right? Or with this fight you just got in with your spouse or, you know, whatever. Um, but really just feeling like, okay, man, this, this is what shitty feels like. Okay. I got this, you know, and then moving on then doing something maybe to distract yourself. And then maybe later coming back to, okay, now it's been two hours, do a little breath work, do a little sitting, do a little observing, maybe a little body scan, right? These are mindfulness practices and notice, okay, where am I right now? Right. How, how am I, what is my check-in right now? If there's one word I could, that best defines how, I am in this moment. What is that one word? And I love that one word drill, Garrett. It's really powerful. It's just a check-in. It's a status check, right? Mm -hmm. um, we do this all the time on the radio with each other, right? We call up our operational units in the field and say, hey, Garrett. I mean, we, we use radio codes and all that, but like, hey, Garrett, what's your status? Like, yeah. are you okay? Right. You know, right. <laughs> are you safe? Right. You know, and we can do that to ourselves with this, with this mindfulness practice of just checking in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then there's the action parts of seeking intervention, which most of the suffering we are going to experience in life and on the job require intervention, right? So this idea that we can just muscle through it, oh, I'm going to the gym. I can just, you know, I can just, you know, throw my kettlebells around and build strength. That's awesome. And it's not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. hundred percent. agree. It's. Uh, I mean, the, the, the first thing I did when I got the diagnosis and well, the first thing I did was went on WebMD, which is not a good idea, <laughs> but, um, the second thing I did was, was call my therapist and be like, who, who I had been away from for some time and was like, I'm going to need some help navigating this. Cause I, I, I am now in territory. I don't know how to navigate. Yeah. And got myself back into regular therapy just to work through these things and some of these feelings that were coming up in these thoughts and particularly the ones about judgment of self and uh, and, you know, trying to find attribution. But then also what you've said twice, the Carl Jung, Jung quote, um, really having to dissect some of those past things 
either, you know, work related trauma or maybe childhood stuff or whatever it is like those absolutely come to bear on whatever situation you're dealing with now. And I know the vast majority of people won't believe me. I didn't necessarily believe it. And then doing the work I was like, oh, 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 <laughs> like, like really seeing the thread of how I respond to this is the same as how I've responded in the past. And then because of that, because of identifying it, labeling it, recognize it, being able to choose a different reaction, a different course, uh, a different treatment option moving forward. Right. And the only way I got to do that was by recognizing how I'd done it in the past. Otherwise, going back to habits, I probably would have responded to this in a habitual way that I responded in the past. And those things obviously weren't serving me uh, in the way that they, I needed them to. And I had the opportunity to create a new path because I was becoming aware of those things. So they, those things absolutely play into, uh, into your life, whether, again, unconscious or not, they're there. And, um, and again, I sound like I'm patting myself on the back for all this. It's absolutely not. It's uncomfortable to talk about, but I know it's necessary because I know that people are out there resistant to some of these ideas, but that's the one thing that might make the difference, uh, from put, someone putting a gun in their mouth. Right. Like if I yeah. can do that here, if I can talk about this awkwardness to prevent yeah. that, then this is a win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Y yeah. Um, no matter what state of suffering anyone listening is in, there's hope. And and it requires some action, right? And, and what you've described, Garrett, is this beautiful example of um, of mindset, of intervention, and of a pathway towards post traumatic growth, right? So there's no question that. What's interwoven in your experience with this this disease is both a medical issue, right? It's a disease, but it also, you know, part of your action was to go back to your psychotherapist. To, okay, you know, like, dude, you know, I, I need some support as I journey through this. And then what also bubbles up is other things in your history, right? And again, you know, for those listening, you're like, ah, I'm not going to talk about my childhood relationship with my, you know, mom or dad or whatever. Okay, fair enough. That's fair. That's not even really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, is just cultivating a greater awareness of how you show up in the world and, and, and maybe more importantly, how you're showing up with your own relationship to self, right? What's your relationship to your inner narrative? What's your relationship to your physical body? What's your relationship to your emotions? And the, the really remarkable thing about you know, mindfulness is that what it really does for us is it helps us to transform our relationships to ourself and to everything around us. So part of what you're going through, Garrett, as you describe it, is you're cultivating a new relationship to self. Said differently, you're cultivating greater personal agency. So greater capacity to move through the next thing that's hard and to do it really fucking well. And, and that I think is lost on us sometimes when we are in the early stages of, of confronting our suffering. We don't see that, no, there's post-traumatic growth at the end of this. We don't see that this is the crucible in which I'm foraging yet one more level of my warrior badassery. And, and so we run away from it, but really we need to run to it, work with interventionists, and, and just get in it, right? Embrace it and cultivate a new relationship with it. And, and it doesn't mean everything's all coming out wonderful all the time, exactly how we want. Probably that'll never happen. But right. we, we are with what we have because that's all we have, right? Just like your Dalai Lama quote, right? We, we don't have yesterday. We don't have tomorrow. We have today. It's, and if we're miserable today because we're not really fully there, that, right. that's, that's, that's sad. Right. And, and so many of us are, yeah, our head is, is into the weeds on what hasn't happened yet. You know, there's, you quoted Epictetus earlier. I love a, a, a quote from Marcus Aurelius that says, uh, you know, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. 
<laughs> and uh, I think that's Marcus anyway. Uh, and of course, then there's always a, there's a similar Mark Twain quote of, uh, you know, I've worried about many things in my life, most of which have never happened. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> and, right. But, but it's, you know, you just, you hit on something that is so, is so on point and I, and I'll, I'll share it because I think it's important for people to see, like, when you talk about this relationship to self and having a, a different relationship to you, it's funny you said that because I've been referring in journaling recently, I've been referring to myself as Garrett three, like Garrett version three, <laughs> you know, and like I've had these kind of marked transitions in my life from you know, corporate music executive into law enforcement. That was probably like version one to two. And then version two was like the last 17 plus years in law enforcement. And now I feel like there is, I, there is a very palpable, tangible transition happening for me, uh, which I jokingly write down as Garrett three. Um, but that is, is very real. And I hadn't, I was describing it as a transition in terms of um, priorities or beliefs and that sort of thing. But I get really what it is, is a transition and a changing of relationship to self, you know, and, and an understanding of what is valuable to me and what's important yeah. and what I want this next phase of my life to have in terms of meaning and, and intention. Uh, so man, that, that was a great light bulb money moment for me right there when you just said that. Well, and Garrett, what's so important about that is that you know, the arc of our career is this journey you're talking about, right? We come into the career generally young or young-ish, and, and we have this identity. We have this relationship to self, often really deeply rooted in our profession. And naturally, we are going to evolve as a human being. We're going to evolve as a professional law enforcement officer or firefighter, whatever we're doing. And we don't know how to do that very well. Right. We still, you know, we can be 25 years into our career and still want to hold on to this identity that we had when we were, you know, a rookie cop, for example. And I think that the evolution of self is so critically important. And culturally, we're, we're sort of influenced to hold on to identity of self. And it's like, well, it's going to change. It's absolutely going to change. And I think one of the failures we have to our people inside of our institutions is that we don't one normalize the evolution of self. We don't teach how to do it. We don't train how to do it. And then we get to the end of our career and we feel like we're not relevant and we, we get discarded and we see a lot of you know, senior law enforcement officers kind of get discarded on duty in their own agencies. And we sort of ostracize them and like, oh, I've been doing this for 28 years and they're still a patrol deputy, you know? And it's like, well, that's honorable, right? Yet, and who knows what that person's going through internally. But um, I think that this natural evolution, if we embrace it, we're going to, we're going to go through multiple waypoints in, in the evolution of our career that are going to be transition points. Sometimes they're going to be influenced by diagnoses. Sometimes they'll be influenced by traumatic experiences. And sometimes they're just influenced by a, a personal awakening that comes from another source, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I think we need to embrace and honor that process. And let's face it, man, our culture is, is doing us a disservice because I think that our culture and public safety, um, one doesn't even honor vulnerability and authenticity. And, you know, we, we don't know how to deal with the really hard shit that we mm -hmm. go through in life. Yeah. And we want to, we want to make it an easy, you know, social media post, or, you know, we instantly go to the, the brawn and tattoos and it's like, well, that's cool. That's useful. And it's again, not enough. You know, there's a bravado and I would even go so far as to say, um, a, a hyper masculinity in our culture that absolutely one is not aligned with, with any, any spectrum of masculinity, but also it, it's, it's toxic and it's harming us because we're not capable of having conversations like this. And when we get to states of overwhelm and suffering, we often retreat inward and we know that that drives us towards hopelessness and helplessness and suicidal ideation and suicidal actions. And, and we just simply have to confront that. And we have to, we have to lay some accountability to our own culture, which we're all complicit with. Right. Yeah. It, to, to, I mean, I could continue talking about these concepts for a long, long time. And I know you could too. 
I want to end with some actionable things people can do. We've talked uh, at times s- specific tactics. We've talked kind of esoterically about the bigger ideas or the bigger concepts, but you know, leaving the conversation for someone who's listening with the with the with sort of the agreement or the understanding that for for the listener, the agreement that people are that you are suffering in some way, right? And that doesn't mean it's that's like a trauma specifically, but there there is something in your life that you have to deal with. But maybe it's the big stuff, and we'll take a, a slice of that pie and talk about the big stuff. You know, something that you don't know how to necessarily navigate in the immediate moment. I'd like to talk about some specific strategies you would suggest, and then I'll jump into with some on things they can do, like starting right now uh, to begin to integrate that trauma into uh, a resolution. Yeah, um, I think the first one is um, schedule a, a physical appointment, um, like an like in-person appointment with your integrated medical professional. Um, go see your doctor <laughs> uh, and have a physical, do a full physical, get your blood work, you know, um, check your metrics. Right. And then through COVID, most of us have been doing this stuff virtually, you know, let's get in there, you know, let the, let the folks that draw your blood, do their thing, get your data and then talk to your doctor about your data. Okay. So there's your, there's, there's one, um, and pursue, and from that pursue integrated medicine interventions, right? There's all kinds of really amazing things happening in that space. Um, the other one is to explore um, psychotherapy or explore coaching, which is not psychotherapy, right? Um, so there's lots of really great opportunities for professional coaches, uh, career coaches, life coaches, performance coaches, there are all kinds of names. They're all kind of the same concept. Find someone who's a certified coach and work with them or go see your psychotherapist or both, right? Um, if you can find a good psychotherapist, it's a game changer, right? And also I'll say this, finding a good psychotherapist can be challenging. So like you talked about earlier, Garrett, you had to advocate for your health care. You have to advocate for your mental health care too. And sometimes you may need to find a therapist and then after two sessions, fire them because you just don't have synergy. You've got to have synergy with your psychotherapist. And that doesn't mean they're saying things you don't like. It just means that, you know, you have to have good energy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the third thing I would say is, um, reflect on your social relationship health. You know, what's, what's, what's the realm of your social relationships? What does that look like? Um, how are you showing up to the people that you love? Family members, close friends, etc. And just reflect on that. Um, and, and consider maybe a couple other things. Consider a practice of, of setting an intention with those relationships. And then, you know, beyond that, um, you, you know, I would, I would encourage folks to, you know, pursue some training in mindfulness that's culturally competent to, or maybe not even culturally competent, you know, <laughs> maybe just go to the weird hippie, you know, mindfulness training day and, and be uncomfortable and learn some things. Um, but begin to explore yourself on a deeper level mm-hmm. if, that's, if that's something that, you know, you're willing to do. Yeah, I think those are all great. Those are all important. They're all they're all things that I uh, eventually had to do or did do right away. Um, you touched on one earlier. I think the one word check in on a regular basis is a great idea. Just I am feeling blank, you know, and that might be upset, overwhelmed, uh, at peaceful, uh, you know, and then recognizing that body and doing that body scan really tighten the chest or my back hurts. I don't think there's a coincidence that back pain and anxiety or trauma are closely, you know, uh, they're synonymous with each other almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and doing those things and culturally, culturally competent, uh, clinician is really, really important. I love that you pointed out that you may have to try several different people, not everybody knows what it's like to be a cop. There are psychotherapists, just like any human being, who will judge you for your work or not understand the work you go through. So you have to put in the work to, to find those people. Uh, when you're confronted with negative thoughts, uh, I try to uh, practice the quick the question: Is it true? You know, and and just asking myself repeatedly: Is it true? Is it true? And then, as I said before, look for the lessons. There's always a lesson. 
And sometimes that lesson is really profound and sometimes it's very funny and sometimes it's very simple, but there's always a lesson. Uh, and then I would always, I tell people, I would suggest to if you have a foundational set of beliefs, whether that's Christianity or another religion or it's stoicism or anything else, go to that and go do deep work into those foundations because regardless of what it is, if it's for, if, if that speaks to you, you will find solace in that and you will find strength in that. And so for me, uh, it was going right back to the Stoics and really diving deep into, uh, well, meditation specifically and the art of living. Those two really, really, really were important to me. And uh, a lot of, a lot of the uh, Buddhist ideas around um, compassion, self-compassion, uh, loving kindness was really, really uh, impactful for me. A lot of those things, those things worked for me. They may not work for you. Uh, you may find the Buddhist stuff too out there for you. That's fine. Uh, but if you have a set of beliefs, go back to them and use those as a foundation. That's what I would add to that. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, you know, the contemplative traditions hold tremendous wisdom. And, uh, yeah, if you, if you have a contemplative tradition of faith practice, or maybe not even a faith practice, but just a interest in a particular way of thinking, um, that can be super helpful. The one thing I want to leave your listeners with Garrett is, um, you know, we talked a bit about like the, the inner critic and here's the good news. What the data tell us and what the lived experience tell us is that one, you are not your thoughts and you will have really shitty thoughts. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, but thoughts are habits and thoughts can be trained. And so what we can do over time is we can retrain these habits of thinking so that they're consistently positive. And I don't mean like, oh, you know, like we can get ridiculous with this isn't positive thinking. This is <laughs> this is having an internal narrative that's not a dick, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. This is having an internal narrative that um, is intelligent, informed, and supportive of self, right? That's yeah. a relationship to the self because the inner narrative reflects our relationship to ourself. So if we're deeply self-critical, that's probably worth working with, with a psychotherapist because there's something to that deeply self-critical habit that is rooted somewhere that's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. um, but the good news is we can retrain our habits of thinking with, with skills practices like mindfulness, with psychotherapy, with integrated medicine, with contemplative practices, you know, like you talked about. Um, and there's a lot of hope for, you know, having, having a inner narrative that is really supportive. Then it doesn't mean that we're not going to be visited occasionally by, you know, the inner asshole in our head. Cause that's just part of being human. It, again, it's not perfect yet. The more we pay attention to information, internal, external, the more skillful we'll get at working with that information. The more we continue to avoid that information, internal and external, the more we'll continue to avoid it. And outcomes that are kind of consequential to avoidance will show up. So true. So true. And they're going to show up whether you deal with them or not. And if you don't, you're going, you're going to suffer at, you're going to be hooked and suffer at the at the at the feet of those thoughts, rather than being able to take some agency over it. Going back to what you said at the very beginning, uh, great advice, Richard. I could I could talk all day. I really could, and I know. <laughs> but uh, appreciate you being here. Where can people learn more about what you're up to and how to uh, enlist your help in in their journey or with their agency? Because you do a lot of agency training. So let's I do. Yeah, let's share with yeah. people where they can find you. Yep, mindful badge dot com um, or richard at mindfulbadge.com is my email address uh, we've got some we got some things coming up this fall uh, in december early december we've got a three-day retreat in uh, arizona and hopefully end of february same thing in oregon uh, so we i do a lot of work that's sort of client specific and now that covid sort of allows us to we're starting to do more work where anyone can just sign up and come and train with us that's awesome i uh, highly encourage everyone to check out richard's work uh, uh, we'll put the links in the show notes so that everyone can just click through right from the episode. Um, thanks again for being with us and spending this time walking through this with me. Uh, you're my guinea pig. 
I said at the beginning to try and like bounce these ideas off of and, and walk through this process publicly. Uh, and I, and I appreciate your, uh, your grace as we went through it. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Privileged to be here, Garrett. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're new to the show, make sure you check through our catalog of episodes because you're going to find some amazing guests and some great actionable ideas you can take into your day. Also, I want to offer you something I'm very excited about, and it's absolutely free. It's my Tactical Tuesday newsletter. Every Tuesday, I want to bring you a few tactics, tips, and strategies to help you succeed in the week ahead. It may be a book I want to share, some gear I found useful, an inspiring quote, or anything else I think you'd like. To sign up for the Tactical Tuesday email list, you can visit the squadroom.net forward slash Tactical Tuesdays, or just text your email address to 805-364-2331. That's 805-364-2331. If you didn't catch that, check the show notes for this episode and you can find it there. And I promise we won't sell or spam your email address. Before we wrap up, I have a challenge for you. If you got something out of this episode, if you were inspired by our conversation today, I want to challenge you right now to take a photo of your podcast player as you're playing this episode. And I want you to share it with three friends, people who you think need to hear what we talked about today. Send them this episode and recommend that they listen to it. Also, please consider leaving a review on the podcast player of your choice. If you have a few seconds, please leave a comment with your review because it really helps us spread the word about the show and it helps more cops find the valuable lessons that we have here. Also, join us on Facebook at our Facebook group, follow our page, and on Instagram at The Squad Room. A special thanks to today's sponsor, OfficerPrivacy.com. If cleaning up your name on the internet and making it harder for criminals to find you is important, check them out at OfficerPrivacy.com forward slash The Squad Room where their deal for you as a listener of this show is they'll give you a free USB data blocker and one month of free monitoring when you sign up. I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, InTime. InTime is a state-of-the-art, easy-to-use, and incredibly simple way to schedule shifts, improve subpoena compliance, reduce officer fatigue, and manage special events, and much more. Make sure to check them out at intime.com forward slash the squad room to learn more about their affordable and simple solutions for public safety. Also, there are some other great companies who support the podcast and support you as well. Go to thesquadroom.net forward slash support to see exclusive deals from Signature Coins, Hard to Kill Fitness, Onnit, Ranger Up, Hardhead Veterans, and Audible. And if you're looking for the best fitting ballistic helmet that exceeds NIJ standards and won't break the bank, check out hardheadveterans.com and use the coupon code SQUADROOM to get $20 off your helmet. All right, until next time, take care of each other and stay safe.